Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Psalms 103. 620, I'm told. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgetteth all of thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth my life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfy thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like an eagle's. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He had made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plentiful in mercy. He will not always chad, neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us after our sins or renewed us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As for as, as for as the east is from the west, so has he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitteth his children, so the Lord pitteth them that fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembered that we are dust. As a man, and as for man, the days are as grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And the place thereof shall know, know it no more. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for this 445. We thank you for this group of men that you allowed me the privilege to be able to speak to today. Lord, I'm just your vessel. Lord, I just pray that whatever I have is from you. I pray you let nothing come forth out of this mouth. It's me. Lord, I pray that I be hide behind the cross and let you be seen, let you be known. Holy Spirit of God, that you would flow up and down the pews of this chapel, that you would have your way with every man that is here today. Oh, God, I pray that a heart will be enlightened. I pray that a heart will be turned. I pray that the fallow ground will be broken up. And I pray, Lord, that you move mightily and bountifully. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. This psalm came about as I was sitting at work. They started laying people off. And this was this past week. And I, as they were laying off people, I, I started hearing names of people that were getting laid off. And I was pondering if there was a common reason why they were laying certain people off, you know, if I could look. And there wasn't any rhyme or reason to it. The company just decided that that's what they were going to do to save some money. And they've got every right to do what they're doing. And I said to myself, well, am I on that list? Am I on that list to be laid up? Because there's no rhyme or reason why they're letting people off. And although I'd been there a, a number of years, it didn't mean anything. And I said to myself, you know, it reminds me of Psalm 103. I can't go to the owner of my company and say, you got to keep me employed here because I'm Mike Herbert. I'm the preacher. They don't care that I'm a preacher. They don't care that I do what I do. To them, I'm just an employee. And I can't go to them and say, well, I do a good job for you, so you should keep me. No, I can't do that either. Because there's other people that literally could do my job. Although I think I could do it better. <laughs> but I'm, I started thinking about Verse 14, and in verse 14, for he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. I come to realize as I was sitting in my chair, wondering if I was the next person on that list, 
I come to realize that I've got no control if I'm on that list or not. Yeah, I mean, I could do things that will adios me out the door. I mean, yeah, I could, you know, do some things that will cause me my, my layoff. But if I'm a hard worker, I'm doing my job, and, and just sometimes just things happen to people. And I come to realize God's keeping me where I am. And God's in control of my job. He's in control of my bosses. He's in control of the company that I work for. And if God's going to keep me employed there, he's going to keep me employed there. But there's nothing I could say to God. Say, God, you've got to keep me here. God's got, God would laugh at me if I said such a thing. And God's in control of where I work. He's in control of my life. He's in control of your life. And we can't tell God that we're somebody and that, you know, we should be able to cling on to our jobs. And it's interesting that <laughs> in Genesis chapter 2 and 7, speaking of the dust, it says, And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils a breath of life. And man became a living soul. We started out as dust. Psalms 103, David gives praise to God for all that he's done, realizing that we're just dust. We started out as dust, and then God breathed life into us and made us a creation. Job says in 7, Job 7, 5, he says, My flesh is clothed with worms and clouds of dust. My skin is broken, and because... I become lonesome. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Oh, remember, my life is wind. My eyes shall no more see good. And then in Job 10, 9, he says, Remember, I beseech thee that thou hast made me as the clay, and wilt thou bring me into dust again? I'm just clay. I'm just dust that has been made into a man that God's created. And we're not in control of our lives. Yes, we make decisions. Yes, we have a free will. Yes, we're able to do some of the things that we do. But in the grand scheme of things, God's in control of everything. He decides if you live. He decides when you're going to die. He, he knows the last day you're going to take your breath. And he knows all those things. But Job says in 33, 6, he says, Behold, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. I also am formed out of the clay. And God has you and I as dust with some water put on the potter's wheel, and he molds us. And he makes us to who we are, amen? And he makes us the kind of man that we are. But all along the way, we're at the mercy of God to mold us. We're at the mercy of God to be able to create us into what he wants us to. And when we, if we come down with a sickness, if we come down with an illness, we can't blame God for it. We say, God, why didn't you make me this way? God, why didn't you give me what, this illness? Why didn't you give me cancer? Why didn't you give me whatever it is? It wasn't God's fault. It wasn't God's fault that Sin came into the world, and when sin came into the world, disease and every known horrible thing came with it, but it wasn't God. But we're at the mercy of God. We're at the grace of God. God, I prayed, and I prayed to God, I said, God, you're in control of my life. You're in control of every life of the guys here at the rescue mission. And yes, you're a God who answers prayer. And yes, you're a wonderful God. And everything David said, Psalm 103, as you read the whole entire message, it's an incredible testimony of how awesome God is. But that God would look upon you and I and know that we're made of the dust of the ground. Paul echoes verse 14 in 2 Corinthians 4 and 7. He says, but we have a treasure in earthen vessels, that excellency and the power that we may be known of God and not of us. And then in Romans 9 and 20, he says, Nay, but O man, who art thou that repeatest against God? 
Shall the thing that formed say unto him that formed it, why has you made us this way? You know, we can't go to God. And we can't say, God, why did you make me this way? Why did you do what you do? In Ecclesiastes 3 and 20, he says, the, Solomon says, all go on to one place. All there are of the dust. And all return to dust again. And all will return to dust again. Amen. We came in as dust, we'll leave as dust. 1 Timothy 6 and 7 says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we carry nothing out. And I started to think how reliant I am upon God. As I sat in my chair and I wondered, am I the next one to be on that list? And I started to think of the men here at the rescue mission. I started to think of the, the men that I see at the prisons. And I see that we're totally, in a lot of ways, we're not in control. We're not in control of the weather. We're not in control sometimes of circumstances. Things just happen. And I realized we're just made from the dust of the ground. And I think it's humorous that men would shun their fist at God, say, God, this, God, that. Really? You're made out of the dust of the ground and you're, you're pointing the fist at God who created you, who keeps you, who molds you, who keeps breath in your lungs? Really? But I've come to realize it's no different than a baby and a mother and father. Because that child totally relies upon that mom and that dad for existence. If that mom and dad doesn't shelter that baby, doesn't feed that baby, doesn't do all the necessary things that a baby needs, that baby ain't going nowhere. And it's no different from us. If God doesn't help us, if God doesn't sustain us, if God doesn't give us nourishment, doesn't give us a place to stay, doesn't give us a job, doesn't give us the things that we need, we're, we're, we're absolutely nowhere. And David realizes this, but we are, God's in control of everything. And Isaiah 64, it says, but now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we are the work of thy hand. We're the work of his hand. Every gift that you have, gentlemen, every gift that I have, God's given it to us. Yes, certain people could do certain things that other people can't. Hallelujah. And God's given you a gift that I probably don't have, and maybe I got a gift that you have, but God's given you at least a gift. God's given you a mission field. God's given you everything. But we're just made of the dust of the ground. Our tendency is to sin. Our tendency is to think of ourselves. Our tendency is to do the things that we do. When I see a people murdering other people, I see of the horrific things that mankind does to one another. I see the terrible atrocities that take place around the world. I see the persecution that takes place. I see the heart of man that does certain things to other people that you wonder how in the world they ever had that thought. It doesn't surprise me because we're made out of the dust of the ground. We're just dust. And I've said to you, as I've said to myself, as I've preached a thousand times, if you see anything good within me, if you see any good in Mike Herbert, it's because the Lord Jesus Christ has changed it. Because the Holy Spirit has worked in me to change it. Because the potter has me on the wheel as he has you that know him as Lord and Savior. And he's molding for himself a bride for the Lord Jesus Christ. A bride that he can present. And he's not looking for some mediocre bride. He's not looking for some half-hearted 
bride, but he's looking for a bride who's on fire for him. He's looking for a bride that loves him and is sold out for him. I wouldn't want to marry a woman that just has half-heartedly loved me. I wouldn't want that. Neither would you. But you'd want somebody that's on fire for you, somebody that cares. And if you're on the potter's wheel and God has you on the potter's wheel, he wants to mold you. We know that the heart of man is wicked and deceitful above all things who can know it. We know that scripture verse inside and out. But the good news is we don't have to stay in that condition. The good news is if we allow the Lord to be able to put us on that potter's wheel and mold us into what he wants us to become, we can be useful. We can be great for the kingdom of God. And David comes to himself and he looks at his salvation in the Lord. He looks at who he is in Christ. And some think that he penned Psalm 103 in a song because he had just came out of a serious sickness that he was in. That's a theory. I, I don't know if that's true, but that's a theory. But he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgetteth all thy iniquities and has healed all thy diseases. You see, gentlemen, in salvation, we've been given a new birth. In salvation, we've been given the precious Holy Spirit of God to live within this earthen vessel. We've been given the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome those things in our life that we cannot overcome on our own. We don't have any ability to overcome them, and quite frankly, we're, ha we're happy to live within our sin. We're happy to live within the things that we do because either a disbelief in God or just we just don't care. But God wants to change that that's within you. And David gives praise unto God for who has redeemed my life from destruction, who has crowned thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Gentlemen, if you've been saved, if you know Jesus Christ, if your sin debt has been, debt has been forgiven, trust me, his loving kindness and his tender mercies will show up. It's unavoidable. Who satisfies thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like an eagle. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. And he, uh, he does. He executes righteousness and judgment. He has made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plentiful in mercy. I just preached on mercy not too long ago. And I talked about how God showed his love and how God's mercy was poured upon you and I and I demonstrated that in David when David was not even looking for God in 1 Samuel chapter 30 actually 27 through 30 wasn't even looking for God was happy to live in the enemy's camp was happy to fight against Israel his own country that he was announced king in but God poured his mercy upon David and allowed other kings that were from the Philistines to turn David back to Israel because David wasn't smart enough to go back to Israel himself. He wasn't even seeking God, but God used the ungodly kings of the Philistines to turn David back to Israel. And God's mercy has shown into this that he's given you the Milwaukee Rescue Mission. That he's coming you giving you a place to be able to hear the word of God. That he's not only giving you a meal, that he's not only giving you a bed, but he's giving you the bread of life. Amen? Amen. He has made, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor renewed us according to our iniquities. You know, Verse 10 always gets me because I realized that I wasn't looking for God. I didn't care about God. And I could have lived the rest of my life in indifference 
not caring about who God was, and I wasn't looking for him. But God poured out his mercy upon me, and he could have just said, you know what, you're made out of dust. You could just live in that condition, roam around like an unknown all your life, and just never know the power of God. But the Holy Spirit come upon me like he'll come upon every one of you. He'll show himself real to you. And he'll say, you don't have to live like you're an animal. You don't have to live like you're just from the dust of the ground. With no purpose, no plan, no direction, just wandering through life, hoping that you make it through another day. But God says, no, I got a purpose for you. I got a plan for you. He could have left us in our sinful condition. He could have left us just headed for a devil's hell. But he, no, no, he's appeared. To every one of you, he's appeared. And he's shown you that he's for real. He's shown you that he has life. And he has shown you that he's given you more than just the dust that you came into being. But the Bible says in Genesis in chapter 2 and 7 that he breathed life into you. He breathed life into me, and we became a human being. We became somebody that has a soul, someone that will live forever, a soul made of mind, will, and emotion that will live forever. We're not only just dust, but we've been given a soul, an eternal soul, somewhere that will spend eternity either in heaven or hell, depending on where you choose. I remember preaching a funeral for the mother of my two children that passed away back in 2010 from alcohol. She lived on the streets and she died from alcohol. And I preached her funeral and people said, uh, people asked me about it. I said, well, according to Ezekiel, and I believe it's Ezekiel 38, it could be wrong. But in the book of Ezekiel, all the souls are mine. This, and I found value in her, not because she was the mother of my two child, two children, but I found value in her because God finds value in her. And God, God finds value in her because she had a soul. And yes, she came into this world the way she was. Yes, she was gifted a certain way. And yes, we're all gifted a certain way. We come to this world with certain habits, habitual habits. We come into this world wired a certain way. We come into this world with all sorts of presets, all sorts of conditions. But the conscience can be molded. Molded by society, molded by ourselves, molded by the Word of God. We could dictate how our conscience is going to think. And no matter how we're wired, no matter how we come into this world, no matter what dust of the ground you and I are comprised of and made out of, we're valuable in the sight of God. We're valuable because we have a soul. We're valuable because he made us and breathed life into us. And we're valuable because he sent his only begotten son into the world to die for us. And he sent Jesus into the world to die for us because he realizes that we're made out of the dust of the ground. He realizes that we can't save ourselves. He realizes that we have no ability to be able to appease the holiness and satisfaction of God. We have no way to do that. We have nothing. What do we offer God? We've got nothing to offer him. We're just made out of the dust of the ground. And all we could do is lift up our hands and surrender and say, God, take me. Take me, Lord God, as yours. Help me, Lord God. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Save my life. Save my soul. I love what verse 12 says. As far as the east is to the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Like a father pitteth his children, so the Lord pitteth them that fear him. He has pity upon us. He realizes, David realizes, he says, we're made out of the dust of the ground. That's all we are. 
And the Father looks down upon us and he realizes that we don't have an ability to know who Christ is. We don't have an ability to save ourselves. We have nothing to offer God, just as I had nothing to offer my company. To be able to say, you ought to keep me because I don't have anything. And at that point, I was like maybe a lot of you guys. You're on the edge of getting laid off. You don't know if you're going to get laid off or not. And you say, God, just be gracious to me. God, have mercy upon me and allow me to be able to stay. But again, that's God. God's in control of my boss. He's in control of my company. He's in control of everything. And I realize that I've got a relationship with God, and I know that he loves me more than I love myself. And he re I realize that everything he does is for my good. Everything he does. And I only have that because I surrendered my life to him. I only have that because I realized at one point in my life, I'm just made of the dust of the ground. I realize that I'm totally relying upon God, but in faith I believe that God's going to get me through. In faith I just believe that God is going to make a way out of no way, amen? I just believe that somehow God was going to make a way. And there are some of you that are in here today. You don't know Christ. You tried to make it on your own. You tried to do it all by yourself. And you tried in your best strength and in the best way you possibly know how to try to make it through life. But you're made of the dust of the ground. And if you were to die from this life and face Christ, you'd say, what? That I should enter heaven because I've been made of the dust of the ground and you breathed life into me and I became a living soul? No, that's not good enough. Because God, God has offered us a way to not only be dust, but to make something of this life, to make something of this person. Yes, we come into this world naked and naked will we'll return. We came into this world with nothing and we're certainly taking nothing out. But I tell you this, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, if you are living for him, you come living and you're out in a blaze of glory because you brought people to the Lord. You've done things for the Lord that he's called you to do. And there's crowns being put on a crown. There's putting jewels that are put, being put on a crown for you when you enter heaven for the things that you did for the Lord. And the Lord is able to to say, well done, my good and faithful servant, now I enter into my rest. And he's able to do that to those that know him. To those that are willing just to admit that they're made from the dust of the ground. They've got no way of going anywhere, doing anything. But they're willing to trust Christ. They're willing to put their faith and their trust in the finished work of Christ. And say, Christ, mold me make me and change me into who you want me to become. Amen. Don't let me stay where I'm at in my life. Don't let me stay where I'm at in my walk, but continually change me that I may become the man that you've called me to become. I realize I've come into this world and I offer you nothing, but through the Holy Spirit that lives within me, I can do all things, Jesus. I could do all things who Christ Jesus that strengthens me. I could do all things because the Holy Spirit resides within me. The third person of the Trinity is inside of me and is occupying this dust that's been given life. And I could do what God's called me to do. I could be faithful to him and I don't have to leave this world as just dust but I can leave this world as, as you can in a blaze of glory for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's wanting to do that with every man in here today. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you, Lord God, for every man that is here today. Lord, I thank you, Lord that you breathe life into this man and you breathe life into every man that is in this place today. And Lord, I thank you for the work that you're doing 
in the lives of those men that are here today. Father, I ask you right now, if there's one that does not know you, if there's one that does not know the saving grace, Lord, that they would come up to me afterwards and pray. If there's anyone that just needs prayer, that they'd come up to me, Lord God, and I'd be more than willing to pray for them. But I pray for those right now that do not know you as Lord and Savior. And I call out to you, Lord, please save their souls. Please, Lord God, don't let them return as dust without making a mark on society. Don't let them return as dust without having their soul be gone on to heaven. But Lord, I pray that you move mightily and bountifully. I pray, Father, you give us hope, that you give us, Lord God, what only you can, and that's salvation. And I thank you, Lord God, that in salvation, that you cast our sins as far as Jesus west, now to return no more. I thank you, Lord God, that you pour your pity upon us. And I thank you that you're a loving God. I thank you, Lord God, that you are here today. And I thank you for every man that has come, Lord God. And I ask you right now, if there is one that does not know you, but being convicted by the Holy Spirit, Lord God, that you would lead them to come. And I pray, Lord God, you bless the meal to their bodies. I pray, Heavenly Father, you bless those who have cooked it, those who volunteered, those who have donated their time and their talents. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would reconcile the men in here with families, if they have families. And I pray, Lord God, if there's any need, that they can come to me, and I'd be more than happy to pray for them. And I pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen.